I often make a decision about whether to spend tens of thousands of pounds in a matter of minutes. But before I developed the system that allows me to do this without making a terrible mistake, I had to spend hundreds of hours stressing over spreadsheets and scrolling Rightmove until I quite frankly never wanted to see a house again. So how do you get to this point? And why do so many investors spend loads of time researching, but still make really bad investments? Well, to find out, let me ask you this. Have you ever made a long car journey that's just gone perfectly and you've arrived almost bang on when you expected to? Okay, maybe it doesn't happen as often as you'd like, but when it does, it's probably not because you've added up the average number of seconds you'll need to stop at each set of traffic lights, or you've assessed the exact probability of getting stuck behind a slow lorry. It's because you'll have got a couple of key decisions right. You decide to take the A road rather than the motorway for a certain section because traffic is generally better at that time of day. And you set off early enough that you've got a bit of a margin for error. It's exactly the same with property. Most successful investments come down to getting a few key numbers right and making generous estimates for those that you can't know for sure. Most investors either obsess way too much trying to calculate everything down to the cost of a stamp to send back the signed contract or give up trying because it seems so complex and just make an emotional decision which can work out horribly. So over time, I've perfected a spreadsheet that I use to quickly capture the numbers that really matter and know almost instantly whether an investment is a goer or not. You can grab your own copy for free using the link in the description. I'll walk you through using it now. Then at the end, I'll share the biggest mistake that most people make when doing this for themselves. So we'll start up in the top left with your purchase costs. And these are costs you pretty much know. So start by putting in what you think the purchase price should be, but you can play around with this later. The stamp duty calculates automatically based on the current rates in England and Wales, assuming that you're paying the extra 3% that investors have to pay. But this could change or your circumstances could be different. So feel free to just Google stamp duty calculator and type over this number. If you need to do a refurb, add that in, and then you'll be paying fees to your solicitor and maybe a mortgage broker. So just put in an estimate. I use £2,000, but this won't make or break anything. And then finally, there's furnishing. Maybe you furnish the property, maybe you don't, but if you do, just pop an estimate in here. Out of all of those, it's the purchase price and the refurb that really matter. Then we come down to running costs. So if it's a flat, you'll have a service charge and you might have ground rent. You should be able to find those on the right move listing. I just bung them both in together and I put it as a monthly amount. So if the listing gives you the annual amount, divide by 12. If it's a flat, then insurance will normally be included. But if it's a house, I'll normally stick in like £15 at this point, just as an estimate, again, monthly. Then if you're covering the bills, which is normally only the case in a multi-let, I will put that number in here as an estimate per room per month. So if it's five rooms and £20 for each, that's £100 in this box. Then there's one more box for just anything else you want to put in there. Right, that's quite enough costs. Let's get some income. So listable units is one if it's just a normal house or a flat. I only use multiple units if it's a multi-let, so there are, say, four rooms. And then I put in the estimate of the monthly rent per unit. So again, if it's just a normal house or flat, there's one unit and I put here £1,200. Now we get into assumptions, and this is a really important bit. So LTV is loan to value. So that's the amount of the purchase price that you're borrowing compared to how much you're putting in. So if you're borrowing 75%, which is what I normally do, that's what goes in here. Next is the interest rate you're borrowing at. So you can put an actual number in here if your broker has given you an indication, or you can just put an estimate. Then there's a management percentage, and this is the percentage of the monthly rent that your lessing agent will charge, including VAT. If you're gonna be managing yourself, then just put in zero. Then we're into costs that you're really just estimating. And these last two boxes are why it's not worth stressing about every last potential cost, because whatever you put in as these two numbers, they will be wrong. And they can be so wrong that they override 20 other smaller numbers that I haven't even bothered to put in the spreadsheet. It's normally a good idea to work with a set of standard assumptions that you keep consistent between properties so you can compare like with like. But you need to know that the reality is not going to match up whatever you put. And later, I'm going to show you why that doesn't actually matter. So first there's repairs as a percentage of the rent. This is probably where you're gonna be the most wrong. I'll normally put in four or 5% for a flat and about 10% for a house, but really it could be anything. I'll come back to this later. Then there's voids. So this is how many weeks of the year the property is empty for and you're not receiving any rent. Again, this will be wrong. I generally assume a flat turning over every year with a gap of one to two weeks, or a house turning over every two years with a gap of three to four weeks. Either way, you end up with two. With all that in place, we can then move over to key metrics on the right-hand side, and I put the numbers that matter in green, so you only need to look at two of them. 
First, there's monthly cash flow. This is obvious. This is the profit that you'll be expecting to get after all of your costs. Then there's ROI, return on investment. And this is the cash flow that you're getting divided by the money that you actually put in yourself. So this for me is the most important number because it's the best comparison to any other investment that you could make. Then if you want it below that, there's a little breakdown of your monthly profit and loss. So now you know how much money you can expect your investment to put in your pocket each month. But this isn't even half the story. And I've included another tab on this spreadsheet to try to save you from the mistake of fixating on all this stuff too much. We'll explore that now. But first, if you're finding the video useful so far, please give it a like and consider subscribing. We've got lots more videos coming up with free tools like this one. Right, let's come on to the growth tab because I said that income is less than half the story. And that's because you also expect to get capital growth from your property. I used to just ignore this from a numbers perspective because sure, it'll probably happen, but there's no way of knowing how much it'll happen. So you might as well just not worry about it and think of it as a bonus when it comes. But this is a mistake and I'll show you why. If you flip across to the growth tab, it looks a bit overwhelming, numbers everywhere, but it projects out three very useful metrics. And for all of these, you've got the average annual increase in property prices going across the top and the number of years that you own the property for going down. So property value tells you what you could expect your property to be worth after a certain number of years, given a certain average amount of capital growth. So if you held the property for 10 years and it grew at an average of 4% a year, then your property that started off being worth £250,000 will then be worth £370,000. Now, of course, you're definitely not going to own a property for five years and have exactly 4% growth every year. Within any given year, anything could happen, including really sharp spikes and really sudden drops. But the point here is to establish an average over time. So maybe you believe that on average, property will outpace inflation by 1% per year because that's what it's done on average since 1860. So if inflation is 2%, which it's supposed to be, then your property would grow by 3% every year on average, meaning that after 10 years, the property that you bought for £250,000 is going to be worth £335,000. Of course, if you're feeling more or less optimistic about the annualised growth, you can just look at a different column. That's kind of cool, but not that useful really. So let's move on to the next one, which is your equity. So this shows your equity portion over time, which is always growing if property prices are going because your mortgage, if you've got an interest only mortgage, stays exactly the same. And as the value grows, all of that growth is yours. So at the 10 year mark, assuming again, 3% average annual growth, then your equity is worth 148,000 pounds which is kind of cool because if we go back to the income tab, you can see that's just about double the cash that you put in in the first place. Then finally, there's the most important one, which is ROI. This is the average annual growth that you're making in your investment purely as a result of capital growth. So here again, we can see that if there's an average of 3% growth over 10 years, then you'll make an 11.3% return on investment from that growth. Hang on, property price is going up by 3%, but you're making 11% off that why is that? Well, that's because you haven't put in all the money. So the property is growing as a percentage of its full value, but you didn't put all the money in. So your share grows faster. It takes a bit of getting your head around, but it's actually a really powerful concept. And it's quite exciting because when you realise that 3% average annual property price growth equates to an 11% growth in your investment in this example, because you didn't put all the money in. This makes the 2.3% you're making from the rent seem far less relevant, but still you can add it in. So add your 2.3% rental return to your 11.3% capital return, and you get more than a 13.5% annual ROI. Again, this growth stuff is all speculative. So you can just ignore the growth tab completely if you want to. But I like having it on the sheet because it focuses my mind and it helps you avoid a really common mistake. Imagine you've got a choice between two properties, one where the rental ROI is 1% higher and another where the annual growth rate is likely to be 1% higher. Obviously, you're taking a gamble on the capital growth, but if it does happen, then in this example, after 10 years, the difference between 3% and 4% growth is about £34,000 in terms of equity which is a massive difference. And this tab is why I don't stress out too much about whether I should be budgeting 6% or 7% for repairs. Not only can you not possibly know, but it also pales into insignificance over 10 years, but it's natural for your focus to be drawn to the here and now. So even though I know this stuff, I still like having it here to remind me. But even if you avoid falling into that trap, there's still a big problem. How do you get right the most important number on this whole sheet? 
which is how much you should be paying for the property in the first place. Because if you overpay, which is really easy to do, even if you think you're getting a good deal at the time, it could take years of growth just to get you back to zero. But over the years, I've developed a super quick and easy way to avoid this mistake. So keep watching this video to learn how to do it yourself.